now to introduce our presenter for tonight's lecture. Peter Zale holds a master's degree and PhD in plant breeding and genetics from The Ohio State University and is currently Associate Director of Conservation, Plant Breeding and Collections at Longwood Gardens in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. In this position, he leads curatorial activities, the Plant Breeding Program, the Plant Exploration Program, and the Plant Conservation Program. His main efforts at Longwood have centered around development of a comprehensive conservation horticulture program focused on native orchids of the United States and temperate terrestrial orchids from around the world. In his spare time, do you have spare time, Peter? He has been building his own private botanical garden with extensive collections of hardy geophytes and orchids, woodland plants, trees, shrubs, and a variety of other plants that reflect his personal plant exploration efforts. So at this point, I will turn things over to Peter to get us started for tonight. All right. Thanks thank for being with us. Oh, thank you, Amy. And uh, thanks to everyone uh, for attending. Thanks to the Jenkins Arboretum for having me. One of my favorite gardens. I'm a big uh, rhododendron enthusiast, so mm -hmm. I love the collections there. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, okay, can everybody see that okay? Yes, we can see it um, at this point and I'll let you know as you're advancing if we have any issues. Thank you. All right, so, okay. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, I'm going to talk about um, some of the work we've been doing at Longwood over about the last eight years or so regarding native orchid conservation. And so I, I'm not sure what the demographic is of people attending, but if you're local, um, chances are that you might have been to Longwood Gardens. And if you've been to Longwood, you know Longwood is a place, is really a display garden, a place of beauty. Um, and people come here for the fantastic plants and the fantastic designs uh, and ways the plants are used. And orchids are a prominent part of this, especially in uh, places like our conservatory. Um, but sort of behind the scenes at Longwood and sort of uh, a, a piece of the history of a lot of the things happening here are, are some more research-oriented activities that are, are happening literally right behind the conservatories. And so things like uh, one of our iconic plants, the Longwood uh, Victoria Hybrid that you see here, uh, was first developed by famous Longwood horticulturist Patrick Nutt. Um, it at Longwood in 1960 or 1961 and is really one of our iconic plants. And um, what most people don't realize is that these huge plants that you see here um, are actually only about eight or nine months old from seed. They have to be renewed from seed every year. And so there's this, you know, work happening behind the scenes um, at Longwood. And I'm going to get into a little bit of that. And perhaps if you've been to Longwood, uh, and chances are that many people have come at Christmas time. And so this is really our busiest time of the year. And honestly, I really don't have much to do with this at all other than enjoy it and help plant some plants in the conservatory. Um, but uh, just sort of setting the stage for what Longwood is in case you've been here and maybe, uh, you know, want to be reminded or if you haven't been here before. But where I really want to start is at the very beginning of, of the gardens. And so Longwood really started um, long before uh, industrialist Pierre DuPont bought the property. It started when sort of as we know it now, um, it started in 1698 when the property was um, inhabited by the Pierce family and they started a farm here. And George Pierce was the original um, um, farmer on the property and his twin great grandsons became really interested in trees. And what happened was, is they would go around Chester County, Southern Chester County here, in Northern Maryland, other places and collect trees and bring them back to the farm and plant them. And they happened to be doing this at a time when famous nurserymen in Philadelphia, like William Bartram, were also um, selling some really interesting trees. And so they became friends with, with people like Bartram and really planted this cutting edge arboretum um, of the day. And so this happened in the 1700s, the trees matured throughout the 1800s, and then in 1906, 
when Longwood started, uh, it was because these trees were slated to be cut down because at that time in Pennsylvania, uh, there wasn't a lot of timber left in this part of the world. And so it was really valuable. And Pierre DuPont came in and purchased the property and that's when Longwood Gardens started. So in a way, um, the gardens sort of started as an act of conservation really to, to conserve these trees. And then the gardens as, uh, as I know them and as we know them sort of grew around this collection of trees, which you can still see uh, to the east of the Pierce DuPont house. Um, um, many of the original trees are still there. But um, as the gardens developed, you know, other interests came about and orchids are, I think, are one of the things that a lot of people really identify with Longwood Gardens. And so our, our orchid room that you see right here was just renovated uh, about a year and a half ago and reopened. And this collection is really um, interesting because what you see here is about 250 to 300 plants on display all year round, but it takes a permanent collection of about 5,500 plants that are growing behind the scenes to make it happen and to make it look like this basically every day of the year. So we have this long commitment to growing orchids at Longwood Gardens. And when I started in 2015, there was interest in beginning uh, a plant conservation program. And we wanted to sort of dive into that world um, with the understanding that public gardens and places like Jenkins and, and many public gardens, if not all public gardens, really play a role in helping conserve plants, not only here in greater Philadelphia, but um, around the world. And when I started at Longwood, we, we did this project called the Hagley Project, and it was started by the, the curator that was here before me. And, um, and basically what it was is we compiled the invoices, correspondence, notes, what have you, of all the, all the bits of information that the DuPonts um, um, created that related to purchasing or obtaining plants for the gardens. So we took all this information, put it all together, put it into one spreadsheet that came to about 38,000 line entries. And there's many, many interesting bits of, of uh, you know, horticulture of the time in there. But what was really fascinating was in about 1923, the DuPonts ordered several native orchids from a nursery or perhaps, I don't, you know, some, uh, you know, a, a, a gatherer or somebody, you know, in North Carolina who sent them native orchids. Among them, the one shown here, the showy orchis, uh, uh, Orchis spectabilis, or now called Galliera spectabilis. And so I thought, well, this was really interesting because, you know, right around the time they were building the conservatories and, and becoming interested in growing um, um, epiphytic orchids and tropical orchids, which were really trendy at the time, they also recognized, um, you know, these native orchids and, and developed an interest in them. And I think speaks to a little bit about their savvy when it came to orchids. And so we took this nugget of information and we started to study more about our native orchids here and realized, you know, this is a great connection for us. Many of our native orchids are, are rare or um, were never common to begin with in the region. Many of them are very beautiful. They have a lot of uh, idiosyncrasies when it comes to cultivating them and propagating them. And so that's where we decided to enter the world of plant conservation. And so if you look at our program, what we're really trying to do is understand more about um, and develop expertise with the orchids that we have here with the hope that we can generate information um, to help orchid conservation worldwide. And so um, that's exactly what we've done. So um, over the last eight years, we've developed a lot of partners and collaborations. We work a, a lot here in Pennsylvania. We're doing a lot of work with going out into the wild, um, seeing orchids in the wild, finding them in the wild, um, getting permission to collect the seed, and then really looking at how to propagate them. And you can see from the images there on the right, propagating orchids is, is quite different from a lot of other plants because orchids have these tiny dust-like seeds that in the wild not only need to land in the right place to germinate, but the right fungi need to be in the soil. And the orchids have a relationship with this fungi and basically farm fungus in the developing seedlings and use it as a food source. And so you have to use laboratory techniques by and large um, to, to overcome um, this, um, this barrier often to, to germinating them with typical means of germinating seeds. And so that's a lot of what we're, we're doing. And I'm going to talk a lot about that. But ultimately, what we want to do is propagate a lot of plants so that we can 
grow them here at our garden so that we can do experiments to learn how to grow them. A lot of our native orchids have a reputation for being impossible to cultivate, and that certainly applies to some of them, but I'm going to talk a little bit about today about some of the ones that are actually not very difficult to grow if you have the right conditions. And so we're generating these seedlings. We're doing this research that really looks at the horticulture of orchids and really the role that horticulture plays in, in plant conservation. And so through this, we're actually doing restoration of orchids in the landscape. We've got a few projects that we've embarked on. We're hoping to do more. And as I mentioned, this is all rooted in exploration. So plant exploration is, is one of my um, the core responsibilities of my position that involves looking for plants here in Pennsylvania, but also um, around the U.S. and around the world. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but really um, exploring, you know, native areas uh, for new plants is something that is relatively new to Longwood. There we go. So, as I mentioned, one of the things that we're interested in is, is looking for orchids and charting where orchids are growing, because many of these plants are rare in the wild. And so uh, we work with many agencies here in Pennsylvania. We work with the Pennsylvania um, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, um, Bureau of Forestry quite a bit, um, especially through the Pennsylvania Plant Conservation Alliance, which is something that has really been developed in the last five or six years or so to really support conservation activities related to state listed species. And so working through a network of, of, of professional contacts of, of, you know, people in the field, um, you know, uh, amateur botanists, citizen scientists, you know, all kinds of different people were trying to chart where these orchids are growing. And this feeds into our um, ability to be able to collect seeds. And so one of the things we've been working on is developing a seed bank um, of native orchids and, and other types of orchids as well, uh, and trying to understand how to germinate the seeds of all of the orchids that we have here in the U.S. And there's about 220 species of orchids uh, in the U.S., north of Mexico. About half of those are probably endemic to Florida, um, and the others are are spread um, across the US. We have about 60 species of orchids or taxa of orchids here in Pennsylvania. So ultimately our goal is to develop a database to, you know, that has information about how to propagate, how to germinate the seeds of all of these native species. And so this just gives you, um, uh, uh, it shows you what our, our database looks like. We have about 800 samples in there now. And what's important to note is that amongst native orchids, well, we might collect seeds of the of the large yellow lady slipper well um, we don't want to have that from just one place because that is a very widespread species there could be differences between populations and ability to germinate the seeds so for something like large yellow lady slipper we might have 75 accessions of seed and so we're really trying to get the broad view of of how these things respond to um, our methods especially across um, wide geographic areas. So I'm going to talk a little bit about lady slipper orchids because these are, I think, really flagship species for among Native um, American orchids. I think they're probably one of the most, if not the most recognizable um, of our Native orchids. The picture here shows uh, the large yellow lady slipper growing here in, in southern Chester County where there's a few populations um, that we know about. Um, but when I started at Longwood, there was interest because the, the uh, local conservancy um, has these plants growing on their property. And there's only about a half dozen or so uh, clumps of, of uh, stems growing there. And so the idea was to hand pollinate these and, and try to propagate them so that we might be able to do um, a restoration uh, uh, study. And so what we did was we were really interested in, in looking at ways to more efficiently propagate um, these plants. And so we know that from a project from Kew Gardens called the Sainsbury Orchid Project, where what happened was in Europe, there's a yellow lady slipper species and it's native to England. And what had happened was, is that over time, it had been collected to the point where there was one plant that anyone knew about left in the wild. And Kew Gardens said, oh my gosh, you know, this, this is an important species. We need to propagate it. And I mean, literally 
um, this plant um, has a guard uh, next to it, or at least it used to when it was in flower because they were so concerned about people coming uh, and taking the plant. So what they did was, you know, they hand pollinated this existing plant, they were able to get the seeds, and they sowed the seeds, they gave them, you know, they, they experimented with them, they tried to figure out how to germinate them, and they couldn't do it. And what happened was, is um, they got a tip from a thoracic surgeon in Sweden, of all places, and he said, you know, you should probably try to, to grow them from embryos, which basically means that you harvest the seeds before they reach maturity. So you think about the lady slipper flowers in May, it's pollinated, it's set seed, the seeds would typically disperse, let's say, in October, maybe into November. Um, but his theory was that if you harvest them earlier and you can find the right point where the seeds have actually um, formed, but the factors that make them difficult to germinate haven't formed it, you can actually have a lot more success. And so, um, and so that's what we what we wanted to test because we really wanted to propagate these plants because as I mentioned, There we go. As I mentioned, the, the yellow lady slipper is a very widespread species. You can see that yellow blob right there is basically the entire range of the species. So it's you know native here in Pennsylvania, but it's also native in Nova Scotia and the North Shore of Alaska and the mountains out west and the Midwest and, and all places in between. And many of the plants that um, are in cultivation right now were propagated from a population under that red dot, which is Itasca County, Minnesota, the headwaters of the Mississippi River. And if you can believe it or not, um, an actual orchid paradise. Minnesota is the only state in the union whose state flower is actually an orchid. And it's because of these incredible orchid populations that occur in Itasca County. Well, there also happens to be a gentleman there named Bill Steele, who has perfected propagating lady slippers over decades of work. And he propagates the yellow lady slippers around his property and he sells them and you can buy them. And, and that's great. But what we were really interested in with our project was propagating our local form. And so what we did was, is we, we, we hand pollinated flowers um, of our local species. We took this idea, this idea of embryo culture, the idea that we can actually more successfully propagate them if we harvest the seeds early. And that's what we did. We, we tested harvesting them um, between, I think, 40 and 60 days originally and narrowed it down to 45 to 55 days. We sowed the seed um, on sterile tissue culture medium. The discs that you see down there in the bottom right are actually little bits of russet potato. And so these things, these, um, I'm in the middle of a presentation, thank you. Um, um, these little bits of um, uh, potato in here um, actually stimulate germination um, and help the plants grow. And so different types of orchids, um, um, require different things. Paphiopetalum, for instance, a different type of lady slipper orchid, they tend to do better if you add coconut or pineapple um, to the mix. And so, um, so we add potato, we put them, um, the, the cultures um, um, in the dark at room temperature, orchids need to germinate in the dark, another sort of weird idiosyncrasy uh, with them. And lo and behold, um, all the experimentation we did, all this work um, results in, in germination. And so if you look at this, um, if you look at this uh, um, timeline, you can see we hand pollinate, we harvest the seeds in June, we sow them. In about a month, they start to germinate. Six months later, they're ready to transfer on. And this is all done in our laboratory under sterile conditions. Um, and um, uh, once, we, once they grow to a certain size, we put them in these test tubes. They grow on. I actually have some right here. I don't know if it's probably hard to see, but we do this every year now. Uh, and we're able to grow them um, really by the hundreds, even the thousands um, in tissue culture. But the most difficult part of the whole process is when you take them from this nice sterile environment where they've been growing, let's say, 12 to 18 months in a test tube, and you need to actually get them to grow outside of these controlled conditions. And so what we do is we take the seedlings, we put them in a plastic bag, take them out of the test tubes, put them in a plastic bag, put them in the fridge, uh, or a cooler for, uh, let's say, four or five months. We give them a, a cold period because they can't grow unless they have cold. And so once we take them out of the cold, we put, we pop them up, and this is what they look like as they emerge the first year. So 
once you get to the point where those seedlings I just showed were growing, that takes about two years. You're about two years into the process. To get to the point where you have a plant um, like you see here um, takes about oh, another three to five or maybe 10 years. And so a lot of times if you're purchasing lady slippers or if you want to add them to your garden, the plant that you're getting, if it's flowering size, it's probably at least five years old already. Um, and so that's, you know, oftentimes orchids can be expensive to purchase. I mean, no matter what type they are. And that's often because to get to a flowering size plant for many orchids takes a long time. And a fascinating fact about the yellow lady slippers is that here, pictured here is a population up in Berks County. You can see these big clumps of lady slippers. Those are probably one genetic individual with, you know, several stems per clump, and you can see them sort of dotted along that hillside. There's some indication that these plants could be hundreds of years old. And in Europe, again, they did a study with the yellow lady slipper there and, and realized that the generation times, or at least estimated that the generation times were about 100 to 360 years or something like that. So these plants can be extremely long lived. So I think, you know, we know that in the wild, they can live a long time. And even in cultivation, we have plants here at Longwood that are were planted in 1963, and they're still going strong today. And so it's fascinating to think that, you know, plants that we're propagating right now and planting out into the gardens or perhaps using for restoration, if we get the conditions right, you know, and the, and the conditions remain, they could, you know, literally last for hundreds of years or at least decades. So that was work we did with the large yellow lady slipper. And if you want to grow a lady slipper, a native one in your garden, I think I've even seen them growing at Jenkins. The large yellow lady slipper is, is a good one um, to grow. Another good one, if you can find it, is the Kentucky lady slipper. And this is another native species um, that's our largest or one of the largest of all the lady slippers, uh, but also the most rare. And so it's very rare in every place where it occurs. You can see the map down there in the bottom, a uh, very odd uh, disjunct distribution. And so we were interested in this plant, not only because it's, it's rare and it's beautiful, but also because we wanted to know if the techniques we developed for the large yellow lady slipper were applicable to some of these other species. And so that's exactly what we've done. We're using this species, the Kentucky lady slipper, to build an ex situ collection. So basically we're growing seedlings of, from different places around its native range um, here at Longwood and assessing the differences with the hope that someday, you know, this can serve, or the gardens or at least our research nursery can serve as a repository um, for the genetics of the species. There's estimated to only be about 5,000 plants of the species left in the wild, which is really not very many. And we've also done some work with the state of Texas where they're actually um, growing some on and they're going to be planting some out. But this is a, a weird species because it not only occurs in places like Texas and the Deep South, but there's this bizarre disjunct population in Eastern Virginia. And uh, you can see a picture of it here. You can see the large plant right there in the center uh, growing amongst um, um, Osmunda regali and uh, Melanthium virginicum and some other really interesting plants. Um, and so we've been able to propagate these and some from Texas and some from Georgia, and we're growing them on at our garden. And if you come to Longwood, this is one you can actually see because despite the fact that it's so rare in the wild, it actually does extremely well in cultivation. And so some of the original plants that we propagated, you can see um, sort of at the juncture of Pierce's Park uh, and Pierce's Woods, if you're familiar with Longwood, uh, but we have about a oh, hundred of these planted out into the landscape now with more coming um, in the future. So a couple of good ones that you can grow in your, in your home garden, if you can find them, there's a lot of great mail order sources um, where you can find lady slippers. You just have to get the timing right and the offerings are not always the same every year because again, propagating these can be, can be a little bit unpredictable um, from year to year. So that was a, a case study of, of um, one of our projects related to just one of the many types of native orchids. And so one of the great things about orchids is because they have all these uh, botanical quirks, 
um, as it were, with regard to the seed and the pollination system and the necessity for fungi in the wild, they really are, from a research perspective, um, uh, really enticing because there's a lot of things that you can do and a lot of things that haven't been done um, that are, are fun things to study. And so some of the other things that we've been working on, um, you can see here. And so this idea of embryo culture, this idea of harvesting the, the seeds when they're immature um, with the idea that they will germinate more readily under our conditions is something we want to know more about for other genera of orchids. And by and large, Cypripedium is, is a place where a lot of that kind of work has been done. But with other orchids, there is, hasn't been much of that kind of research at all. Um, I mentioned that orchids have this relationship with fungi. And uh, you can see in the picture there, uh, orchid fungus growing in vitro. What we've actually been able to do is to uh, learn and, and develop techniques to harvest fungi from the roots of orchids or from orchid seedlings um, and actually grow them in our lab. And then we can use that fungi to actually germinate seeds um, of orchids under controlled conditions. We also are experimenting with growing lots of fungus uh, to help improve the transition from uh, growing the orchids in the lab to growing them in our greenhouse or in our gardens. And this all funnels into uh, this idea that horticulture and the techniques that we're developing um, can help impact restoration of native orchids, growing plants that might be able to be planted back into the wild, or just learning more about, you know, what are the needs of orchids in the wild through these uh, laboratory experiments. And so, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And then what we really want to do is, you know, we want to take some of this what we feel like is novel work and we've been able to publish some of what we've done and and really try to impact orchid conservation worldwide especially with terrestrial orchids i'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing with some of that recently so another group of orchids of native orchids that you might be familiar with actually the um the genus with the most species um native to the state of pennsylvania is the genus platanthera uh, which used to be in the genus Habenaria, which is a, perhaps a bit more well known. But Platanthera, um, in my opinion, if I had to pick a favorite native orchid, perhaps I think it might be one of the, the one of the Platantheras because um, they're really beautiful, and you can see they come in a range of colors. There's a range of sizes, and they can just be really um, impressive. Uh, beautiful plants in the landscape, but they also tend to grow in really pristine places. And so they're really, you know, a symbol for, um, you know, some of the last bits of wilderness um, um, in Pennsylvania and really throughout the, the eastern U.S. And so if you look at the genus, there's about 32 species. Um, they're spread all throughout the, the eastern and some in the western United States. Many of them are rare um, in the wild. Um, we uh, Some of them are even globally rare. And so um, there's a lot of conservation work, especially with some Midwestern species that's been happening. Um, but one thing that we see, as I mentioned, we do a lot of field work with orchids. So we're out there, we see what's happening happening to them um, in the wild is, is deer browse especially. And so with the booming population of white-tailed deer, Platanthera seem to be um, especially heavily affected by deer browse because they, they honestly just seem like candy for deer. And even some of these plants can reach probably up to three feet a meter tall, uh, and the deer will literally just eat them right down to the ground. And so um, and so this, you know, this is an issue I think that that hasn't been fully addressed for some of our orchids, maybe a little bit. But uh, so there seems to be this urgent conservation need based on the field work we've done, in addition to the fact that they're very ornamental. The trick is, is that they're considered to be, at least some of them, very difficult to grow from seeds. And so um, if you look at the seed germination, um, um, just harvesting the seeds in the, you know, as they mature in the wild in the fall. Um, you know, it's easy to collect the seeds. It's easy to find them. Some of them will germinate readily, but some, like the one in the image here, the purple fringeless orchid, which is one of the most beautiful, is extremely difficult uh, to propagate. And I thought, oh, we can get around this. We can do it. But our, our initial studies um, sort of came to the same conclusion as a lot of others that had tried to work with this species. And so we thought, well, 
what about this idea of embryo culture? If we harvest the seeds when they're immature, um, you know, before the things that are preventing them from germinating when they are mature, if we can if we can find that right stage, can we propagate them? And so, and so that's what we did. And so, um, so what we did was basically we, we got permission uh, to work with a population of the species up in um, uh, Dauphin County near Harrisburg, did a little pilot study, and we found that if we harvested the seeds about 20 or 30 days after pollination, lo and behold, we could get them to germinate. And so what we did after that was we tried to, to hone in and we harvested seeds at a more frequent date, as you can see there. And what this resulted in was lots of Petri dishes um, in the, the map case in my office, which has the right conditions for germinating them. And then we basically charted the germination for uh, every two weeks for about 30 weeks. And lo and behold, we were able to germinate them quite well. And so this concept that we um, you know, learned uh, working with one orchid, we were able to take it and apply it to this other one that is known to be difficult to germinate. And so you can see a picture of the seedlings there. Um, we harvest the seeds now about, you know, 25 or so days after pollination, or after pollination, yes, and they'll germinate pretty well. And the funny thing about orchids is it's really important to track maternal lines. This is something in the world of, of conservation, tracking maternal lines. Where did the plants come from? What is their mother? Because there is huge, there are huge differences amongst individuals in ability to germinate. And you can see from the results here, um, as few as 5% germinate, but as many as 91% germinate. And it's really variable amongst individual. And so we're learning more about, you know, um, um, the, the fecundity, the fertility of these different orchid populations through working with them in this way. And again, that information sort of feeds into perhaps, you know, how these plants are managed or, um, you know, just in, in general, how we think about them. And so this, you know, this project is, you know, when you think about it, um, what we really wanted to do was, okay, can we propagate these? We figured that out, but, you know, can we get them to the point where we can actually grow them on, where we can get them to the size where we can plant them out? And so, you know, sort of closing this loop. And so, um, again, I mentioned that getting them out of culture and growing them is the hardest part. This is one we're still trying to perfect and, and, and we're working with it. And we've had some success and we've even planted some back out into the wild with a little bit of success. The problem is that the population where this plant grows is right next to the Susquehanna rivers, River. And in years when the river floods a lot, especially this place, the orchids don't tend to come up. Orchids can do this funny thing where they just go dormant for years at a time sometimes when their conditions, their growing conditions are not exactly to their liking. And so last year was not a good year for this particular species in the place where we propagated it from. So we're hoping um, that this year uh, the conditions are a little bit better. But again, you know, the simple act of, you know, charting plants, you know, working with, you know, the agencies that are helping manage them, you know, um, setting, setting up experiments to collect seeds and to, and to get the plants into cultivation. And then again, you know, learning how to grow them as a collection, you know, or as a, as a, as a plant in a garden or a nursery setting, and then ultimately out into the wild is, is what we're really interested with, interested in with a lot of these things. And so, um, but we also do other research, <clears throat> pardon me, we're also doing other research to try to help the process of getting these things to the point where we can plant them in the gardens or in the wild. And so I mentioned orchids are able to, uh, or I'm sorry, orchids have this relationship with fungi. And so one of the things that we thought was, well, many times when we're growing orchids in the lab, we're growing them on on these nutrient rich media that basically serve as a proxy for the fungus and we're growing them under sterile conditions. So when they come out from the lab, they aren't linked up with any fungus as they might be in the wild. And so our thought was, well, maybe we can learn how to grow the fungus separately. And when we plant the orchids, 
um, we can inoculate them with fungus. And so that's what we've been doing. We've been learning how to grow fungus of all things. And we've been doing it on in different ways. And you can see here, we can grow it on millet. Um, we can grow it on these things called sorborods, which unfortunately we can't get anymore. They're basically cellulose plugs. And then on, on potato broth. And so uh, um, we've been testing these different methods to see if we can you know, actually get the fungus growing in the pot with the orchid and get them to link up so that you know, as they you know, progress throughout their lives, whether they be in the nursery or in the wild, they can actually you know, um, have what they need to sustain themselves. And this actually resulted in some research. And so you can see here, um, we published this paper um, where we looked at two different species of native orchids, um, state endangered species, Goodyear tessellata, and Platanthera blaferi glottis, two species that come from very different environments. We grew the seedlings in our lab here, and then we took them and we planted them in four different substrates, four different potting mixes, and we gave half of them fungus and the other half didn't get fungus. And then we used these fancy molecular markers, these molecular techniques to basically look at how much fungus was growing in um, in that in uh, in those particular substrates, and what impact that was having on the survival of the orchids. And without getting into it too much, it basically showed that yes, you know, we actually can see some um, improved effects of survival of plants and the plants were a little bit bigger and a little bit better. And the ones we planted out um, have grown a little bit better since that time. We now have lots of the plants from this study and they continue to grow and do well. And so this is, you know, just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that, you know, orchids, um, you know, lend themselves to in terms of research. This is just something that, that we've been working on. And so we're hoping to do more of that kind of research. That's kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, but, um, you know, but that kind of work is important because again, you know, orchids, especially our native orchids have this, this, um, this, misconception that they're impossible to grow. And I, I, you know, what we really want to do is dispel that myth and really teach people that yes, some you can grow, some are best, you know, probably, you know, um, you know, are never going to be garden plants, but really just getting that information out there and then taking that information and funneling it into um, restoration projects. Um, and so you can see here, we've got four different species four different projects that we're working on across the state of Pennsylvania, but also in Texas as well, where orchids that we're growing in our lab are actually being planted back out into the wild. And we've had um, variable success and, you know, we're, we're in the process of learning, but again, trying to do it in a more experimental way um, so that we can learn from it and so that we can develop protocols and make recommendations so that people, you know, whether doing this with orchids or, you know, native azaleas or what have you, um, that that information is there and it's accessible. And so for this particular project with Goodyear Tessalata, we worked closely with the DCNR at one of the plant sanctuaries, planted out about 80 plants, and we've been measuring um, um, survival since that time. And, and a few of the plants are still going, but unfortunately, this plant grows in these old growth or near old growth pine forest. There's Pinus strobus, there's Pinus pungens, and unfortunately, um, the place where this is growing, a uh, derecho came through and knocked down um, a lot of the big old trees and what used to be this cathedral canopy with this dark forest floor is now uh, an open hillside with a lot of um, multiflora rose and some other um, unsavory plants growing on it. And so not only have our plants suffered a bit, but even the plants, the native ones that were growing there um, are suffering as well. So, you know, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. But, you know, the thing is, we still have these plants growing in cultivation. We still have the seeds banked. We still have, you know, some, you know, um, uh, representation of the plants um, that are growing at the site, sort of safeguarded um, away from there. So this gives you, this is Goodyear Tessalata. It often grows in places where old pine, pine trees have fallen over. And so there's hope, even though, though the habitat has changed, that these this pit and mound landscape that um, results from trees falling over will hopefully uh, keep the plants going there. And there's an image of, of one of the plants we grew from seed um, um, still growing at the site. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, I'm going to switch gears. I know I've, I've talked about a lot, but I'm going to sort of end my presentation by talking about, um, so we've done all this work with native orchids. And, and one of the things I do is is, is work globally um, through our plant exploration program and really 
hoping to try to tie in the ORCID work we've been doing. And so most recently, I've been working in places like Vietnam. So this is northern Vietnam uh, in this karst landscape. If you've been to Ha Long Bay, this is the sort of same formation, just uh, not out in the, um, in the Tonkin Bay. Um, but these these karst landscapes, you know, wherever there's limestone, typically in the tropics, you get high concentrations of orchids and the tops of these hills can have as many as 50, 60, 70 species of orchids growing up there. Um, uh, but the problem is there's huge pressure in places like Vietnam um, on orchids because many are still harvested in the wild for uh, traditional medicine. Uh, a lot of people come from China over the border to buy the orchids. And oftentimes, as you can see in the image here, they're not buying them for ornament. Um, you can see in the image, that's what they're doing. That's Dendrobium nobili, but oftentimes they're just buying them for the medicinal use. So they're selling them by the kilo. So there's these big rice bags just stuffed with orchids. Um, some of the orchids that have suffered really heavily there are lady slipper orchids, like you can see here. There's still a big market for these plants, and it used to be that um, a lot of these plants were harvested and sold to, to Europe or to collectors overseas, but um, now in places like Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, even Bangkok and Thailand, you know, there's a lot of people who have orchid collections. You know, life, I think, has, um, you know, those countries have really um, developed. And so, you know, there's this hobby uh, of growing orchids. And so there's a strong interest in, in getting plants. And you can see plants growing here um, on the mountainside. Uh, and even you can see what happens is they go up, they harvest them, they, they split up these big clumps of plants and they grow them. You can see literally thousands of plants growing there um, in Dixie cups. And so again, trying to take what we've learned about our native orchids and, and work with partners in places like Vietnam and understand orchid conservation needs and see if we can and develop any projects um, um, that are related uh, to this work. More recently, I've been in, in Tanzania, and this is the project I'm most excited about because Tanzania um, in sub-Saharan Africa, tro East tropical East Africa, is home to a lot of terrestrial orchids. And when you get into the highland areas of these countries, you get orchids like you see in the images here. Many of these orchids make a big tuber. And um, what's happened is there's a, a food that's actually made from these tubers called chikanda. And in Zambia, which borders Tanzania to the southwest, it's become something of a, of a national dish. Uh, well, well, unfortunately, in Zambia, they've harvested a lot of their native orchids almost to the brink of extinction. So they're coming over into Tanzania, into some really orchid rich areas and harvesting them. And so what we're interested in is we're actually working with the Tanzanian government and, and different um, parks, national parks throughout the country to learn how to propagate these orchids so that the local farmers uh, who are often growing potatoes in the surrounding areas might be able to one day grow orchids. And so this is, you know, not something that obviously happens overnight. Um, but just to give you an idea that this this work, this research that we're we're doing on our native orchids, um, you know, we're really hoping can have an impact in places like Tanzania and really around the world. Um, and so more on that another time. But really, um, you know, ultimately, you know, we're you know, what we want to do is we have this, you know, collection here at Longwood, you know, in the end, we also want to be able to have some of our native orchids or things like, you know, orchids from Tanzania um, on display in our orchid house so that, you know, I'm talking about them here, but maybe one day you could see them there or even um, out in the gardens um, when they flower in the spring. So I'm going to, um, I know my time is, is coming to an end, but I, I want to just focus um, real quick on them because I realized that you know, I'm talking about a lot of, you know, things that are related to science, and that's what a lot of conservation is. But, you know, perhaps people on the on the uh, Zoom are home gardeners. And so I'm an avid home gardener. Um, I'm very interested in growing native orchids and a lot of our other native plants and unusual plants. And so one of the things that I've been doing is developing uh, bog gardens. And so I've created a blog. Uh, you can see that on Longwood's website, but you can see all these different plants listed here do really well in bog gardens. And basically um, what it is, is in, you know, an excavated area or just an area of a mix of peat and sand um, that holds moisture. Uh, and you can grow these plants really well. Um, there's bog gardens, you know, popping up all over the place. This is one I saw in a rooftop garden in Seattle. Um, you can see all the different kinds of pitcher plants. There are native orchids in there, but this is a really rewarding way 
um, to garden. And there's a couple pictures from, from my bar garden. You can see different types of pitcher plants and flower there. You can see Drosseras, the sundews, um, my, perhaps my favorite native orchid, Platanthera ciliaris, the orange fringed orchid, which is native here in Pennsylvania, does very well um, in this setting. You can see it with the uh, swallowtail on it there um, and all other kinds of plants. Um, you can see grass pinks and um, uh, li pine lilies and all kinds of things do well in a bog garden. In fact, Calipogon tuberosus, the grass pink, uh, is very successful in a bog garden. In fact, I plant. I started with a few plants that I brought with me when I moved here, and now they've actually reseeded all throughout the bog garden, and there's dozens of them in both the white um, and the pink flowered form. And so very, very easy to grow. Uh, and if you get the conditions right, I mean, grass pinks, once you have this sort of, you know, population going, they flower for four to six weeks. I mean, just, you know, from June until mid-July. So really, really great plants. And often growing with uh, grass pinks in the wild are rose begonia. And this also does well in a bog garden. And if you get the conditions right, this one likes a little bit more moisture. Um, this is actually thought of as a weed in the bog garden. It will just sort of run all over the place and pop up here and there. And, you know, really, you know, a beautiful thing that flowers in June. And so, you know, bog gardens are really a great way to be growing some of our native orchids. And there's many more beyond what I've mentioned here that you can potentially grow. So what is a bog garden? So basically, um, you know, these are a couple of bog gardens we've created that are raised beds. You could also, you know, basically dig out a, a hole in the ground, you know, any size you want. You can put a pond liner in there. You could use roofing liner. Um, and then we fill it with a mix of about 50% peat, 40% sand. Some people like to use all peat. Um, if you're concerned about using peat, um, mixing sand in there also works really well. But then um, um, once, um, you know, once you've done that, you let it sit for a week or two, you can start planting in that. And all of these plants are extremely easy to grow. You don't often have to water them. Um, and so just a really, really great way to garden. And just real quick at the end, um, if you're interested in orchids in general, there are other orchids you can grow outside here. Blatilla, as you can see here, I've been breeding these for quite a while. Um, one of my selections was offered by Plant Delights Nursery. It does really well here. It's a massive plant. You might grow Blatilla striata, which flowers for a couple weeks in May around here. This plant called Candles in the Wind, I did not name it, um, it flowers for you know, weeks on end, it becomes massive, it does really well. And so this is a group of plants um, we're working on as well. And we'll hopefully have more selections um, coming down the pipeline in different colors, flowering for longer periods. And so really, um, you should be growing blatillas if you're um, um, interested in just growing orchids. And calanthi are calanthes as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just skip right through those. But thank you um, for um, having me. Um, I'll happily answer any questions you might have. Thanks. Yeah. Let me see here. Yeah. Go. Perfect. We do have a couple questions. So um, the first one is, how did conservationists first realize that the native orchids required specific fungi in the soil? I, I, you know, I don't know exactly. It's been known for quite a while. I think even maybe Darwin might have talked about that a little bit. There was a guy named um, Knudsen um, who did a lot of work propagating uh, orchids for the government, I think, or he's working at a like an ARS station or something like that. Um, and so he started to realize this as he was learning how to propagate more orchids. But it's it's been known for a while. It's just that more recently with molecular markers and, you know, sort of the conservation need for orchids that more has been understood about, you know, the specificity of that relationship, you know, the degree of diversity. And so it's, it's an exciting time for that field of study. Another fungi related question. Uh, you stated that the embryos are kept in a sterile environment. At what point of growth are the fungi introduced into the media? So when we when we're ready to take the seedlings out of the test tubes and pop them up, that's when we um, introduce the fungus. And and so we've done that for some. And what we found with others, some orchids like spiranthes, which are called ladies' tresses, um, mm -hmm. actually 
are pretty easy and they just find their own fungus. And so that's part of, you know, what we're studying is we know that, you know, some orchids are really good at finding fungi on their own. Others don't seem to be able to do that as well. So it's, it's interesting to see the differences between them. Mm -hmm. This question is in regards to bog gardens and deer. <laughs> oh. Are the plants for bog gardens subject to deer damage? I, you know, that's, it's, I, I'm, I'm a gardener. I have deer in my garden. Um, you know, certain things they hammer. The bog garden does not seem to be something that they bother. Certainly, you know, I've seen them nip Saracenia leaves, but I've never had a problem with the orchids getting nibbled. I, I don't know why. I can see their hoof prints in the bog, <laughs> so I know they're there. Um, but, you know, I think it also depends, you know, where you live, how, what the deer pressure is like. I mean, I know it's not quite the same thing for everyone, but, you know, based on my personal experience, the bog garden plants are not favored by the deer. Hmm. That's great. <laughs> A bonus. <laughs> um, so if anyone else has questions for Peter, feel free to put those in the Q&A. Um, I had a question. Um, I'm curious to know more about the seed bank that you talked about. That's is it is it at Longwood and what does it consist of? Is it refrigerated things or non-refrigerated? It yeah, so it's it's here at Longwood. We have a, a a seed cooler here. You know, so we work with all kinds of seed, and so yeah, it's just a a, a basic seed cooler. Um, I worked at a seed bank before I came to Longwood, and so. Our seed bank is managed the same way. We have low temperatures and low humidity, and you know that contributes to long-term storage of the seeds. Um, so that's actually something we're hoping to get into a little bit more uh, moving forward. But um, those conditions so far have been have been good for storing orchid seeds. That's great. Wonderful. Someone made a comment about growing up in Kennett Square and having wonderful memories of Longwood and is excited to see that Longwood's evolved into this level of plant protection. So um, I'm glad that Peter could be with us tonight to, to share that. Great. So Peter, one thing that I do for our um, participants is I not only put our recording of the presentation on our website, but also include some resources. Um, and I did see that you had that, I will find that BOG blog um, to include. Um, is there a place on Longwood's website that talks about uh, the orchid conservation program? There, we do have a website, um, you know, that talks a little bit about it. It's just a blurb and I'll be honest, it's quite outdated right now. And so we're okay. hoping it will be updated. There is a bit of information, but um, I, you know, there's yeah that's that's the best we've got and also there are a couple of blogs too so if you go to Longwood's sort of blog landing and search conservation or native orchids there's a few things that will pop up okay great any other good resources or references for native orchids absolutely so there's a, a great organization called the um, North American Orchid Conservation Center which is housed at the uh, Smithsonian Ecological Research Environmental Research Center. I always get that wrong. Um, and um, we work with them quite a bit. They're doing a lot of great research, but they have a website called, I think it's called Go Orchids. And it's basically a, a catalog of, of all of the native orchids um, in the U.S. There's lots of pictures. There's lots of great information. So if you're just looking to learn more about them and their diversity, that's a great place to start. Wonderful. I will be sure to add that to our, our reference list. Yeah. That's great. All right, last chance, everybody, for any questions. Lots of comments coming in saying wonderful presentation and fascinating. Lots didn't know about how many native orchids Pennsylvania has. So we're glad that we were able to open people's eyes to that. And um, I will attest to our um, our yellow lady slipper orchids. The, the foliage has emerged from our um, leaf mulch. Um, I keep my eye on one patch that is kind of nestled right in with um, kind of a, a rocky area in, in the front of Elizabeth's Walk, if you guys are familiar with that area of Jenkins. So um, I do know the foliage is there and I'm sure in a, a week or two's time, we will also be seeing those flowers. So great. Well, Peter, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks to everyone who's 
still with us out there. And you can join us next month on May 18th. Um, we're going to be hearing um, back from two staff members from Refugia, and we're going to learn about um, their Greenway project and mapping. Um, so be sure to register for that one next month. All right. Thanks again, Peter. All right. Thanks. Bye, everyone. All right. Good night, everybody.